Good evening. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and begin our time with uh, with prayer requests. We'll we'll find ourselves in Matthew 17 in just a few moments. If you want to turn ahead to Matthew chapter 17, that's where we'll uh, that's where we'll continue in our study of Matthew here in just a few moments. Do we have any prayer requests this evening that we need to be made aware of? Yes, ma'am. Tim, Chim, C-H-I-M, what's his last name? What's his first name? Okay. Reverend Chim, thank you. Car wreck, brain injury, I didn't catch much more than that, but well, let's pray for Pastor Chim. This is Ramona's brother's pastor. Thank you. Any other prayer requests this evening? Thank you. Joanne Smith, having some balance, having some balance issues. I think she has stumbled a couple different times, even within the house. Uh, Leroy is convinced that when she eats, she does better. But... Take that for what it's worth. Uh, so let's, let's remember Joanne. Thank you. Any other, any other prayer requests? Let's remember, let's remember Jimmy Williams. That's, that's Blaine's uncle. That's the father of Martha Wall. One of these days, I'm going to figure out all these family connections. I'm going to get them all now nailed in one of these days. No, I won't. see. No, I won't. Just as as soon as I think I've got it all figured out, I ain't got it all figured out. But uh, but Blaine's father and Martha's father are brothers, uh, and so that's the connection. So so Blaine and Martha are first cousins. I knew that Blaine and Martha were cousins. I just wasn't sure what the connection is. But Jimmy Williams is Martha's daddy, and so let's pray for him. He's down at Walnut Ridge Assisted Living now, and he's he's uh, he's been under the weather uh, over the past couple weeks, but. Hopefully he's on the mend and on the road to recovery, but we want to continue to lift him up in prayer. He was in the hospital. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay. He's back at Walnut Ridge now. Uh, before we pray, I do want to uh, make everyone aware of this. I know that probably less than half of our church members are uh, taxpayers of the town of Walnut Cove probably a majority of our church family live outside the town limits. Uh, but either way, it's going to affect all of us because it's the town of Walnut Cove. Um, I've been made aware uh, by some of you, and I've been made aware by a couple of other uh, leaders of, of religious organizations here in Walnut Cove that there was a meeting of the town council last evening to consider whether or not to uh, declare some portion of the downtown area some type of a, a social district. I'm, I'm not particularly uh, aware of all the details, nor do I particularly care about all the details. But I do know that one of the details involved in this vote is whether or not to have an open container of alcohol out in public. And so I just want to make you aware of that. If, if the Lord convicts your heart to speak out in some way, then, then that's good. Um, but I, I ask that you join us all in praying for the town council that they would be given uh, that they would be given wisdom as they make this decision uh, that will affect all of us in the days ahead. Um, I am not aware of all the details. I do know that it got tabled last evening, so the decision will be made in the days ahead. 
Uh, and so let's, let's, let's remember this issue uh, that will affect us in the days ahead. And let's also remember that we do not want, we do not want to allow uh, political issues to cause division within our church. We want to we wanna let the Lord speak where the Lord speaks clearly. Uh, and, uh, and we do not want to allow this division to come into our church family. And it absolutely could. Are, are, do you need, or did you stand to stretch? Or did you stand because you need to speak? Yes, ma'am. Right. I don't like. <laughs> I don't need I don't need to know. All I just I just know that it will affect all of us in this community. And we want to pray for wisdom on the part of the town council. Indeed, and and uh, obviously we we want we want the town of Walnut Cove to thrive economically in every way. We we want we want this community to be better and stronger tomorrow than it is today, um, and and so we, we all would we all would pray pray for that, and we we all would want that as a community. Uh, we want we want there to be more jobs. We want we want everything to improve. Uh, you know, as far as economics are concerned in this town, but. I don't know that any of us want to sacrifice family values to get there. And so there's a fine line to walk, admittedly. Uh, and so we want, we, want just, uh, we, we, we want to bathe this in prayer. We want to lift up our leaders. We want them to represent us faithfully as they make these difficult decisions. So let's, uh, let's all commit as a church to, to praying for our leaders. And we want them to honor the Lord as they make their decisions. So um, that being said, any other discussion on this issue? I'm admittedly ignorant about it, uh, but I do understand what the ramifications may be or could be in our community, and I think it's important that we be aware of these things as we, uh, as we practice being good citizens. Sir. And we're glad you're still here, brother. And we're, we're thankful for you. I, don't, I, I think we would be hard-pressed to find anyone else in our church family as encouraging as, Blaine, as Dwayne Quisenberry. And so we're thankful for you, brother. I know I speak for all of us when I say that. But let's pray about this issue. God, we thank you for the privilege it is to gather this evening. And God, we ask that you give wisdom to the leaders of our community 
Uh, we, we want what's best for our town in every sense of the word. And we as a church remain committed to being a blessing to this community and beyond. We want Walnut Cove to be a better place because we are here and a part of it. Uh, and we want, we want Walnut Cove to thrive economically. We want folks to come from far and wide. And we want more jobs to come to this community. We want, we want the, the, the families of this town to be blessed in every sense of the word. Uh, and we, we, we want to add to that blessing. But Lord, I pray that we would continue to remain a town where, 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 where children are safe, where family is valued rightly, uh, and where we, we want to live in accordance with Scripture. And we, we, want to cultivate, we want to cultivate a sense of community in this town where religious liberty is, is valued and children are raised uh, to, to, to understand the truths of your word. And God, I pray that, that we would strive to be the good citizens that you've called us to be uh, in this town and in this state and in this country. Uh, and we know that as, as citizens of your kingdom, we are called to be the best citizens this country has. And Lord, I pray that we would be the good citizens you've called us to be in, in every sense of the word. And I pray that we as a church would not allow political issues to creep into our church family and sow seeds of division and, and bring about a lack of unity in any way. Uh, but rather we, we lift up our leaders and we pray that you give them wisdom as they make these complex decisions. And I pray that, that we as the First Baptist Church, that we as neighbors in this community will be the beneficiaries of their wisdom in the days ahead. Uh, and all of our neighbors would be. God, I thank you for godly leadership. We thank you for the blessing of, of instituting government uh, that, that, that lead us and serve us faithfully, and I pray that they would do just that. Uh, God, we, we give these things to you, and we, we commend uh, our leaders uh, to you in the days ahead. And as uh, Romans chapter 13 says, I pray that, uh, that we would give honor where honor is due, and I pray that our leaders would indeed be worthy of honor. And God, we, we ask now that you would, would touch those that have been mentioned for prayer. We, we pray for those that are hurting. We pray for those who have received biopsies in recent days, those that, have been, uh, those that have been cut on in surgery in recent days. I pray that you would bring healing to their bodies. I pray that you give strength where strength is needed. We lift up those that have been battling cancer, that have been receiving chemotherapy, uh, we lift up those that have been the recent transplants of bone marrow. Uh, but God, I pray that you bring healing where bodies need healing. And we thank you for the great gift that modern medicine is to us. But we know that ultimate healing comes from you and you alone. And Lord, we also know that you are not just in the business of healing bodies, but rather you are in the business of healing hearts and lives. We pray for those who are hurting in grief. We pray for those who are in mourning, those who have experienced loss in recent days, those who are battling difficulties in their lives, those whose marriage are under strain, those that are experiencing the stresses of life. And God, I pray that you would touch their lives. I pray that you would ease stress, that you would give comfort in a way that only you can, that you would heal the brokenhearted, that you would give peace that Paul writes surpasses all understanding to anyone and everyone in need. And God, I pray that we would be the agents you've called us to be, the agents of grace, the ministers and the missionaries that you've called us to be out in the lost and dying world as you've called us to go. And Lord, I pray that, that you would use us as vessels, as, as tools in your hands to bring blessings uh, to those around us as you've called us to. Uh, and God, I pray that you use us uh, as you heal hearts and lives to be the ministers you've called us to be. We ask all of these things in the strong and saving name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 17 is where we find ourselves this evening. Again, we're picking up where we left off last week. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. We pick up in verse 14 this evening. And I will remind you, as I have reminded you recently, that Pastor Jim for years has attempted to have a one chapter per night uh, speed. And uh, we may never ever get there, but I'm going to try to get through about a chapter each Wednesday evening. Now, we're in, we're in verse 14. We're about, ha we're about in the middle of the chapter. So I don't know if we'll get through half a chapter or a chapter and a half to get back to where we need to be at the beginning of a new chapter. But we're going to take approximately a one chapter a week pace 
as we continue through the book of Matthew. Uh, so we're going to begin this evening in verse 14. Before, before we get there, now that everybody's looked down at their page, before we get there, and everybody's head raises up, uh, I want to just highlight a couple of things. This, this, some of you have taken a look at this book. Some of you have borrowed it and carried it home, brought it back to me. And I appreciate you for bringing it back to me. Uh, this little book is a helpful tool to me. It's called Christ Chronological. Uh, and our, our uh, Pew Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, this actually takes, Holman uh, made this book. It takes all four gospel accounts and puts them in parallel. There are some stories that are unique to the gospel of John. There are some stories that are unique to the gospel of Matthew. Uh, there are some stories that are in all four uh, in fact, uh, I was looking, the, 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 the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four. The feeding of the 4,000 is in two of the four. And so it goes through and it, it actually puts them in parallel. You can see it's color, it's color coded. Some of you can see the color, maybe, maybe not. Matthew's in blue, Mark's in green, Luke is in red. John isn't on this page, but John's in purple. And so it actually takes all four and puts them on top of each other in a very helpful way. I pull this book out. Every springtime, because for me, it is most helpful around Easter. Uh, I think it's really helpful around the Easter accounts and lining everything up. What happened on Friday? What happened on Sunday? You know, which version lines up with which part of the Scripture? Uh, and so it's really helpful for me at Easter time, uh, above all. But it has been helpful in this study of Matthew because there are some passages in Matthew that are exclusive and only in Matthew. There are some passages in Matthew that are also found in, other, in the other Gospels, and it's been helpful to have that as a guide. And that will uh, come into play in tonight's passage uh, along the way. So Matthew chapter 17, uh, the transfiguration was recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And where we pick up in verse 14 is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well. When they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt down before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Let's, let's, uh, let's underline that. No, don't. Well, if you're an underliner, just, just, pay, just pay attention to that, Mark. Verse 17, Jesus replied, you unbelieving and rebellious generation. Woo-hoo, he, there he goes again. You unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately. After getting rebuked publicly, I'm sure they approached him privately. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? Verse 20. Because of your little faith, he told them. For I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not come out of anything except prayer and fasting. So, we see here, once again, the power of Jesus on display. We have seen time and time and time and time and time again through Jesus' ministry. We have seen Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Uh, we have seen Jesus' ministry into Gentile regions within the past couple of chapters. And again and again and again, Jesus flexes his muscle and, and, and displays the power of God uh, in a number of different ways. We've seen him display power over uh, different kinds of physical ailments. We've seen him display power over demons We've seen him display power over life and death itself. Uh, and, so, and, then, and then the greatest of all display was in last week's passage at the top of chapter 17 where we see the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is bursting at the seams with the power of God on display, the glory of God on display. Uh, and Peter, James, and John were told, hey, don't, don't tell about this until my time has come. And so I am not convinced that Peter kept this under his hat until Jesus' and words uh, were, were, were fulfilled. I am not convinced. I have no doubt that Jesus went, Hey, Matthew, guess what we saw? <laughs> you ain't going to believe this. So perhaps, perhaps Peter didn't keep the secret as he was instructed to 
But we do know uh, from verse 13, no, I'm sorry, from verse uh, 9, that, that Peter, James, and John were given a command uh, to keep this under their hats. But we see in verse 14, again, the power of, of Jesus on display. And so time and time and time and time and time and time and time again in Matthew, we see Jesus' power on display. We know that Jesus has divine authority. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament points to. We talked about that this past Sunday. Uh, Matthew, most scholars agree that Matthew as a book was written specifically for a Jewish audience that had an involved understanding of the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible. And so Matthew writes things that Mark, Luke, and John don't write that specifically apply to Jewish customs and a Jewish audience pointing to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament talks about. And so here we see his power on display in yet a new way. But in doing so, he has a wonderful teaching about healing and about faith. Um, but before we get there, let's look at verse, uh, verse 15. Have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers severely. Um, it was common. It was common in Jesus' day for people to think that seizures were the result of demon possession. That was a common assumption. If, if a child of an adult, whoever it is, if they suffer from seizures, it was commonly guessed that that individual uh, was, was, was being possessed by a demon. Now, we have the luxury of 21st century medicine. We understand that epileptics have brain issues. If there are certain, usually visual, uh, not necessarily visual, triggers, then an epileptic can fall out and have a seizure, you know, here. And that has nothing to do with demon possession. Uh, we, we know that seizures are a common symptom of a couple different ailments, and so it is not safe to assume, as the Jews did in Jesus' day, that just because someone has seizures does not mean that they have demon possession. However, Jesus uh, understands that this is a situation of demon possession because, as verse 15 reads, suffers severely, he falls into the fire and often into the water. We see... Uh, the power of demons on display. We see time and time again patterns throughout Scripture highlighting that demons have a destructive desire. Anytime we see demon possession in the life of an individual, the demons always have a destructive end. There's, they're always self-mutilating. There is great harm to the body. Uh, we see a, a very destructive influence of demons. Suicidal tendencies described uh, here in verse 15. And so we see that even though epilepsy... Uh, is distinguished from demon possession. We, we have reference to that back in Matthew chapter 4. Um, we do see clear evidence of demon possession here because of the, the destructive nature of, of the demons trying to cause great harm, falling specifically into fire and into water. Uh, any questions about demon possession on the front end? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 17. Here's where Jesus gets riled up. You unbelieving and rebellious generation. Uh, if you have a different translation... Than, than the Pew Bible, uh, you may see old, faithless, and twisted generation. The word, the word twisted there is used in, in some English translations, but perverse, some, some the, old, the old King James says perverse, I know, I know that, uh, but, but, but the, the, the word there, the, the Greek word twisted, indicates people's distorted perception about Jesus and spiritual truth. A, a, distorted, uh, a, a distorted perception of Jesus and spiritual truth. And so Jesus is, is calling out the disciples. The man, the man says, hey, 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 Rabbi, uh, your disciples couldn't heal him. They could heal some others, but they couldn't heal my son. And so it's in that context that Jesus calls out, you unbelieving and rebellious generation. You, you perverted or, or, or twisted generation. And then he says, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Oh, man. If I was one of the disciples, I would not have felt particularly good that day. This is like when Jesus uh, says, get behind me, Satan. This is not an attaboy Peter moment. We've had a number of attaboy Peter moments in Matthew already. 
But this is not one of those attaboy Peter moments. And so here we see that Jesus' description of his own disciples is similar to his description of the Jewish leaders who rejected him. We saw that back in Matthew 11 and in Matthew 12. And, and so, so Jesus is calling out, calling out the disciples for a misguided view of Jesus and of spiritual truth. I made mention to this after the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, we, we, we have a situation where they, they wander off into the, the Gentile wilderness. And, and uh, back at the beginning of Matthew 16, I think. Don't quote me on that. I think at the beginning of Matthew 16, Jesus is using the illustration of, of leavening, of yeast, to talk about the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the disciples were misunderstanding his teaching, and they thought he was talking about bread. Uh, because we see a situation where they seemed to carelessly assume that he would just provide manna or whatever they needed as far as physical sustenance. Uh, they had just collected seven baskets full of leftovers. And a wise steward would have carried those baskets with them to provide for the days ahead. But instead, we know that they just left the baskets behind, not really caring about their sustenance because they, they just assumed that Jesus would take care of whatever they needed him to take care of. And there's a lesson there, and the lesson is this. Jesus is not on our beck and call. We don't, Jesus doesn't just do whatever we need him to do that day. Jesus has more important things to fool around with than us. And so if we assume a posture of, of that, that God is, is Santa Claus and we can just throw our wish list at him and expect him to take care of our whims, that is a really, really poor posture in the way we treat Jesus. He does not stand at our beck and call. And so, and so we, we, can't just, we can't just assume, oh, my faith is in Jesus... Therefore, I can just act a fool and he'll look out for me. No, we have to practice individual responsibility also. One of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is self-discipline. We, we practice responsibility and we practice good stewardship and we provide for our family in a capable and wise way. Uh, and the Lord blesses us as we go, but we can't just act foolishly and expect him to come behind us and clean up all of our mess. Any, any thoughts on that biblical principle? Let's continue. Let's continue. So, he chastises them for a twisted or, or, or uh, perverted understanding of their faith. How long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Hey, guys, how long is it going to take for you to learn these lessons? How many times am I going to have to say the same stuff over and over and over and over again before y'all get it? It ain't that hard. And so you can see almost just, a, just a, a frustration in his tone. How in the world long am I going to have to deal with this because y'all just keep not getting it? And so you can, you can, man, if I was Peter, I would just want to crawl into a hole and die. I would have been like, oh, man, we're in it now, buddy. We are in it now. So, so bring the boy to me. We read in verse 17, Bring the boy to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon. So if, if, if Jesus is frustrated enough for the disciples, let's just let him take that out on the demon. <laughs> that was probably a good thing for the disciples. If you're, oh, Jesus, if you're angry, why don't you just take it out on this demon over here? That way we don't have to bear the full brunt of your anger. So maybe that's part of it too. Uh, so it came out, and from that moment the boy was healed. From that moment, the the, the Greek word there indicates the same thing that has been indicated in previous passages of Matthew. This is a full and complete and immediate healing. From that moment, the boy was healed. This isn't a gradual thing. This isn't a temporary thing. This is a complete and immediate and full healing of this boy. Verse 19, Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? Hey, boss. Why couldn't we do that? You gave us authority over demons. We've already exercised it a couple times when you sent us into the harvest field. But we, how, how come we couldn't? So, because of your little faith, he told them, 
For I assure you, if you have faith the size of mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Uh, the, the, the notion of a mountain moving was a common Jewish expression. That was a, 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 an idiom, a colloquial phrase, if you will. Where's, where's our uh, middle school English students? An idiom is just a common word or expression to describe a particular thing, and, and that particular expression was common to describe the impossible. Moving a mountain was a metaphor for accomplishing an impossible task. We see reference to it in 1 Corinthians 13. Nothing that Christ authorizes his followers to do will be impossible. Verse 21 does not appear. No, I'm going to put a pin in that. We're not coming to 21 yet. But we see here this is a common expression, moving mountain from here to there. And so Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain to move from here to there and it will move. Now, I don't want to chase the rabbit too far down the trail of apostolic authority. But there is a degree to which Jesus gave Peter and James and John and Matthew and Thaddeus and the rest an authority that we don't have in the church today. I believe that. Not every, not every Catholic agrees. Not every Pentecostal agrees. Um, but but, but we won't, I don't want to chase the rabbit too far down the trail of apostolic authority. But there, there is an authority given to the apostles that we in the church today do not have. So, is Jesus making reference to a particular authority that he gave to them? Or is he making reference to the authority that he gives all believers? I don't know that. We don't know that. But, but Jesus' Jesus example of a faith the size of mustard seed is told in a parable also. And that universal parable is for the good of the whole church. And so, we see a reference to the faith the size of mustard seed in multiple times in the book of Matthew, in the, in the Gospels in general, but even within the book of Matthew, we see this same parable mentioned a couple different times. And so, uh, the faith the size of a mustard seed uh, will tell you, move this mountain from here to there, and it will move. And so we see this is a, an example of a time where Jesus actually is talking about the quantity or the size or the amount of your faith. And I believe... And we, we usually do not talk about faith uh, with, with respect to quantity or quality. We generally talk about faith with respect to the object of our faith, being the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we see uh, what I would argue is a reference to spiritual maturity. As we grow in the faith, as we have a greater understanding of God's Word, as we walk with the Lord Jesus day in and day out, as we have a greater understanding and knowledge of who He is and what He's done then our faith is made more secure over time. And I know that many of you have gone through the waters of the flood and the, and the, the temptation or the trials of fire in your life more than I have. Uh, and so we, we know that when, our, when, when we go through these seasons of testing, that God actually strengthens our faith as we walk with Him day in and day out. And so I would, I would humbly submit, I would humbly submit, that this is less, again, less about the quantity of our faith and more about the, the knowledge and the security of the fact that Jesus is the source of our eternal life and the source of our spiritual strength. And so when we talk about, when we talk about faith the size of a mustard seed, again, it diminishes the quantity. It even diminishes the quality of our faith. And it's really more of a conversation about the object of our faith. And so if our faith is going to be unperverted, untwisted, and and not misunderstood, then our faith must be clear in the fact that it is on Jesus who takes care of us. There may be a question about that. Any questions about that particular point about the, the nature of faith, the amount or volume of our faith, the quality or purity of our faith? Any, any questions about those things? Where does the move mountains? Now, did mountains physically move? In this passage, no. It was a common expression. It was a common expression that Jews and, and even some Gentiles used in that day. A, a, a reference to a, uh, accomplishing an impossible task. However, if Jesus told Mount Horeb to move to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb would have moved. And so there is a, there, we, we, we know that, that God is capable of moving mountains. We know that God can, 
shaped the, wor the world. He spoke the whole thing into existence in Genesis chapter 1. And I would argue strongly that he reshaped the whole thing through the flood in Genesis chapter 6. But, but, but the faith to move mountains is a particular colloquial expression that was used to be a metaphor to talk about the, an impossible task. And so it was not a specific reference to a specific mountain. It was, it was a metaphor that was used throughout Jewish literature to talk about a, a, a task that seemed to be impossible. Yes, ma'am. Do we need a microphone? I'm going to try my best, friends at home. Okay. Oh. Wow. Do you know which mountain it was? Okay. And I don't know if it was Mount Horeb or not. Uh, Miss Carol said that she was in Israel, and the mountain that they pointed her to was the same height and elevation as the depth of the Dead Sea. And that if the obstacle was moved, everything would be plain and level. Right? And so, there's a, there's a very uh, clear picture image of the fact that a seemingly impossible task is not impossible for the Lord. And that God will, God will move obstacles, God will move obstacles in our path when we trust Him to do so. It's good. Absolutely. We still do. Now, let's look at verse 21. Verse 21. However, this kind of thing does not come out of uh, does not come out except by prayer and fasting. How many of your Bibles have a bracket around this passage? Couple? If you're using the Pew Bible, there should be a bracket around this verse. I mentioned this on Sunday in my sermon. There are several instances, there are several instances where we have a bracketed passage, and we're not sure if it belongs there or not. Some Greek manuscripts have it included, some Greek manuscripts do not. Again, as I said Sunday, don't fret. Don't fret. Here's why. Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 and down, is also found in Mark chapter 9. Just, just, just assume I'm right for a moment. I'm usually not, but just assume that I'm right for a moment. Let's assume that verse 21 does not actually belong in Matthew. Let's strike it. Let's just take it. Let's, let's hit the backspace button and just delete it from our page all together. Is it? Okay. There are some passages that don't even have it on the page. And there are some translations that have it as a footnote down at the bottom of the page. But in, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, it reads, And he told them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer. So the principle of verse 21 is in the Bible. It's in the even if 21 doesn't belong in Matthew chapter 17, the principle is still in the Bible again. Nothing about our faith, nothing about doctrinal truth, nothing about theology is affected even if verse 21 doesn't actually belong on the page. And so we see that same principle is in is in Mark chapter 9 uh, and and we see that very clearly uh, and most most scholars today believe that this past this verse chapter uh, verse 21 uh, this um, oh where's my note it's probably incorporated into the text by later scribes later again back in the day they were handwriting these things making copies of these books it was probably incorporated by into the text by later scribes who were familiar with the parallel passage in Mark chapter 9 they knew that it was in Mark's account let's just stick it in Matthew's 2 Whatever. So it ain't, it, ain't, it ain't a big deal. Don't get too ca caught up about it. Um, here's, here's my default. If you, if, if, I'm, I'm going to use the expression of brackets. Some translations have it down as a footnote on the bottom of the page. Some translations, it's not even in print in there. Um, 
But if, if you see a passage in brackets, just assume that it doesn't belong there. Even if we take it out, nothing about our faith is affected. It, it affects no doctrinal issue. Theology is not impacted in any way. I know that we live in a world where folks love to poke holes in the Bible. And they love to cast our faith into doubt. And they love to say, well, clearly this verse doesn't belong in Matthew. Matthew's all a big sham and that doesn't belong. You know? And so we, we live in a world where folks love to sling arrows at our faith. And even if, even if verse 21 doesn't belong on the page, nothing about our faith is affected in any way. So take comfort in that. I hope you do because I do. So any questions about verse 21? Uh huh. That's true. We see it. We see it in multiple occasions, not just Mark chapter nine. You're you're absolutely right. Question in the back, Ramona. Okay, let's keep going. Verse twenty-two. This is going to be fun. How many of you have headings in your on your on the page in your Bible? Headings, it may say, if you're, if you're using a pew Bible, I know it will say, the second prediction of his death, right? This is going to be fun. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna unpack the word second. But the second prediction of his death, at verse 22, as they were meeting in Galilee, Jesus told them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill, uh, oh no, wrong page. I'm looking at the wrong page. They will kill him. And on the third day, he'll be raised up and they were deeply distressed. So, uh, we have, a, we have a, a passage here where Jesus predicts his death. We, we, we know that Jesus does predict his death in implicit ways and in explicit ways from time to time. On the same... I'm looking at my, my, my study Bible, the Holman Christian Standard Bible study Bible. You can come up here and check this for yourself if you want to. But, in the notes on the bottom of the page... It says, this is the fourth prediction of his death. So, I don't know who's doing the counting and who wrote the words on the page. But is it the second prediction or the fourth prediction? It depends on what you're referring to as a prediction. There are a couple of times Jesus speaks very explicitly about his death, burial, resurrection. There are some times where he talks about it in a more cloaked and a more vague and a more obscure way. So... In the, the, I'm, I'm just going to assume this is the fourth prediction instead of the second. In, we see it in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 40. We see Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And we see in Matthew chapter 17, verse 12, uh, references to his death. Each prediction, here's the, here's the point. This is where I, I want you to take this home. Each prediction adds additional detail to the Easter story. Here... This particular example adds the detail that Jesus must be thrust into the hands of men by an act of betrayal. So as Jesus continues to predict his impending death, we get more and more detail over time about what will come to pass. And so Jesus reveals a little bit more each time he talks to his disciples about these things. Because he knows they can't keep it under their hat. He knows they probably would be overwhelmed. We've already had... An example where he called Peter Satan because he said, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to die. And Peter says, no, you won't. And so we see they can't handle the whole truth. You, can, you, know, what's the, you can't handle the truth. But uh, the, the, the disciples seemingly can't handle the whole story. And so he has to give it to them in bits and pieces. But the piece that he adds this time is that he will be thrust into the hands of men by an act of betrayal. Any question about these few verses. Let's keep going. In verse 24, I do want to unpack this. This will be worthy of our attention, I believe. We see a reference to the uh, exercising of the demon in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We see this prediction of his death in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But as you see, if you can, in oh no, my book's falling apart. In this blue up here, this, this deal about the double drachma tax is only in Matthew. This next, this next paragraph is only found in Matthew. It's not common to Luke, Mark, or John. By the way, 
Another fun, another fun fact about the, about the Gospels. My little book is really helpful in seeing the parallels laid on the, laid on the page next to each other. If something is in one book, odds are it's John. There's a lot of uniquenesses to John. If something is in three books, odds are it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because there's a lot more commonality in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If something is in two books, odds are it's Matthew and either Mark or Luke. Matthew has a lot in common with Luke. Matthew has a lot in common with Mark. Very rarely do Matthew, very rarely do Mark and Luke have something in common that's not in Matthew. And so if it's in all four, obviously, if it's in one, it's probably John. If it's in all three, it's probably, probably Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a couple of instances where it's, it's, it's Matthew, Luke, and John, but, but those are few and far between. If it's in two, it's either in Matthew and Luke or Matthew and Mark most of the time. Those are, those are overly general statements. But if you're, ever, if you're ever doing a personal Bible study where you're trying to flip back and forth and see Matthew's account has different details than Mark's or Matthew's account has different details than John's or whatever the deal is, if you're ever finding a personal Bible study time where you're sifting through the Gospels in that way, just know that those are some general rules. This is a rare instance where we have a, a, a passage that is exclusive to Matthew. If there's ever a passage that's in one and not the other three, it's usually John. But here we have a passage that is only in Matthew. So, there's your, there's your Bible trivia fact for the evening. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really change anything. But, who knew? So, here we go. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, back to Capernaum, we've, we've gone all the way around, we've come back to Capernaum. When they came to Capernaum, those who uh, collected the double drachma tax, some of your translations may say the half uh, shekel tax, it may, it may say a half shekel tax, uh, those who collected the double drachma tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the double drachma or two, two drachma tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? Who do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes from? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But so we won't offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. Okay, great. I love this passage. So, here we see a reference to something in the Old Testament. And so I want to just for a moment tease out from Exodus chapter 30 an explanation of the two drachma tax. Okay? The two drachma tax... Was a, 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 it wasn't a, a civil tax. They didn't give it to the Roman Empire. And again, we're, we're living in a day where the, the nation of Israel had been overtaken by the Roman Empire. And so the, 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 Roman, uh, the Roman Empire gave the Jews a degree of autonomy. With, you know, we know the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem had a lot of kind of religious and quasi-political power. And so there, there was a degree of autonomy within the nation of Israel, but the... The political authority, really, at the end of the day, rested with the Roman Empire. And so, so we have taxes rendered unto Caesar, which is most common. And we, we have multiple references to, to taxes in the New Testament. And these are usually political taxes that are part of the Roman Empire. This is a tax that is a, an exclusively religious tax. This is a tax specific to Jewish men. And it's a, they call it a two drachma or, or a double drachma tax. And it's... Uh, it's a tax to support the workings of the temple. We see a reference to it in Exodus chapter 30. And in Exodus chapter 30, Moses is giving the rules for how this is to take place. So they go across the 12 tribes of Israel, and all the Jewish men pay into the coffers of the temple treasury so that, so that the, the temple can function uh, with these dollars. Uh, a double drachma, that's the amount, Two or two drachma. I don't know why we use the word double instead of two. I don't know. Uh, a two drachma could purchase two sheep. Two sheep. And they would have been used as part of the tabernacle sacrificial system uh, within the nation of Israel. And so 
they, they, this, is kind of a, this is kind of an inner workings of the temple system. And so when the, when the, when the tabernacle, you know, when the tabernacle is the tent, they, go, they, they, they pitch the tent of the tabernacle and then the 12 tribes settle in around it in the Old Testament while they're wandering around. By the time, by the time we get to David and we have the era of the kings in the, in the Old Testament, David says it's not fit. You know, I live in this house. It's, it's, not fit for, it's not fit for the God of the universe to dwell in a tent. And so they end up building the temple. Solomon has the privilege of building the temple for the Lord. And so when we talk about the tabernacle system, the atonement uh, sacrifices, all the Old Testament ritual stuff from Leviticus, when we talk about the tabernacle system, we're, we're, we can also apply that to the temple in Jerusalem, the physical brick-and-mortar structure that replaced the tabernacle tent in the middle of the Old Testament. Questions about that? Okay, so here we see a, a, a tabernacle system tax that was implemented back in Exodus chapter 30. So, uh, every Jewish male over the age of 20 was responsible for paying uh, a tax used for the upkeep of the temple in Jerusalem. We see a reference to this in Exodus 30, Exodus chapter 38. We also see this in extra-biblical literature, the, the works of Josephus. I'm, I don't know if you've ever heard of Josephus, uh, a, a Jewish historian that lived around the time Jesus lived, uh, and he writes extensively. I've got a great big book. It's a big blue, big blue book down on my shelves downstairs. It's the works of Josephus. And Josephus was a Jew. He was not a Christian. But Josephus does an excellent job of recording Jewish history in the days of Jesus. And so G, uh, Josephus talks about it in his uh, works. This this passage is only recorded in Matthew and provides evidence for an earlier dating of Matthew, a pre-AD date of Matthew. Some folks debate when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written. I, would, I am of the opinion, this is just an opinion, that, that John may have been the last book written in the New Testament. That's just my opinion. I actually think John wrote Revelation and then John wrote John, but not everybody agrees with that. Uh, the Gospels were dated in different times, and they were written in different periods of time. Uh, but this, this is a good indicator of the fact that Matthew would have had an earlier dating than John because this is a reference to the, the temple, which ended up getting destroyed uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rebellion in around AD 69-70. And so if, the, if, if Matthew was written after AD 70... There probably would have been more discussion about the temple in this particular passage. Anyway, that was, that was all free. That was all free. But uh, here we see this two drachma tax is used for the upkeep of the temple and was the, obligation, was the obligation of every Jewish male over the age of 20. So, again, Jesus exercises authority over nature. Hey, Pete, go down there, cast a hook. First fish, it'll have a coin in its mouth. All right, who knows that? Okay, Jesus is once again exercising foreknowledge and omniscience, but he's also exercising his power and his omnipotence over, over nature itself. And so Jesus tells Peter, go down there, first, first hook, first fish, there will be a coin. Go pay mine and yours, and we'll, be, we'll dispense with this thing. So, uh, really cool power of Jesus on display again in a, in, a, in a unique way in this passage. But the meat here that I want us to carry home is in verse 26. In verse 26. Well, verse, uh, verse 25 begins, Simon, who do earthly kings collect tariffs and taxes from? Their sons or from strangers? They knew real well, who they, they understood that illustration because the Roman Empire was particularly good at extracting uh, material wealth out of the lands it conquered. The, the tax rates were higher for Palestinians than they were for Italians. And so we see there that, that they understood really well who paid taxes and who extracted taxes from whom. I don't want to get into the ethical nature of the Internal Revenue Service or the efficiency thereof. But we know, we know that when 
when poems are greased and when folks get closer and closer to the halls of political power, they may or may not be afforded certain privileges. And particularly in, in governments and systems that are even more corrupt than our own, the sons of kings, they didn't have to pay taxes because they're the son of the king. And they, the taxes were extracted from the little people out in Palestine that couldn't really afford to pay them. So, who pays taxes? And it's from that illustration that Jesus brings home a really powerful point to Simon Peter. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But so that we won't offend them. We'll do this because we want to be we want to be neighborly. We don't want to cause offense. I've I've mentioned this before, even within this sermon series, I think. The gospel is a plenty offensive all by itself. Jesus' message of salvation does not need us to add offense to it. It is to call people to repentance and salvation is a plenty offensive all all on its own. The gospel does not need our help when it comes to causing offense so that we won't offend them. Let's be neighborly and let's do exactly what we're supposed to do. But in this illustration of the, of the, of the, of the sons, Jesus' disciples, hear this, were children of the one true king and they were exempt from the obligation to support the temple, this had enormous implication for Jewish Christians in Jesus' day and in Paul's day and throughout the entirety of the New Testament. If temple taxes were no longer obligatory, sacrifices and other offerings in the tabernacle system are now optional. And so we can we are no longer bound by the tabernacle system as articulated in the book of Leviticus. Paul makes abundantly clear in the book of Galatians that Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament law. Ergo, we are no longer bound by it. We, by God's grace, we live in the new covenant age. We live in an era of grace, and we are no longer bound by the Old Testament law. And that should be a point of celebration for all of us as disciples of the one true king. And we are, we are called sons of God in the New Testament time and time again. And if we are the sons of God, we are no longer bound by Old Testament law and all the trappings thereof. And that ought to get, a, get us all celebrating. This is a great thing for all of us as believers. So, the, uh, the two drachma tax was taken in the uh, annual census. Again, each person of the age of 20 was to give a half shekel to Four drachma, make one shekel, uh, a half shekel offering for the support of the tabernacle system, which was later applied to the temple in the Old Testament. The religious tax collectors approached Peter, the disciples' leader, rather than Jesus himself, perhaps giving deference to Jesus as a popular teacher. So they approached Peter instead of Jesus. But because the temple is God the Father's own house, read, hear this, the Son and those he has brought into the Father's family are exempt from the tax, signaling that with the coming of the kingdom, believers are no longer bound under the Old Testament law. Rather, we're bound under the law of the grace of Christ. That's exciting. That's exciting. Any questions about that? This is great, this is great stuff. Check that fish, Peter. Come on, Pete. Give us, a, give us another one. Check that fish. That's good. That's good. Any questions about this? Yes, sir. We will unpack that as we continue through Matthew, but you are correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's correct. Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm so thankful that the, the wise folks who wrote the notes in my study Bible, they said, um, oh, now I can't find it. 
Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. If temple taxes were no longer obligatory, sacrifices and other offerings are now optional. And so it doesn't mean you're not allowed to do sacrifices anymore. It means there's an option. And we defer, as we did a few months back, to Romans chapter 14 to be our guide there, where there is personal liberty. There's personal liberty for us as believers. We live in the age of grace. Where there is personal liberty, there's also responsibility not to cause a stumbling block for another brother. And so we see in, in Romans chapter 14 a great guide for how to apply that in our lives today. So I will, I will always, they, they, they didn't have to give the tax, but they gave it anyway because they didn't want to bring offense where offense wasn't necessary. And so Jesus, Jesus defers to the old covenant here because it was an option. And so we're not bound by the Old Testament law anymore. But there's nothing to stop us from practicing the Old Testament law. But rather, Romans 14 ought to be our guide in, in that, where, where personal liberty is the, is the question. Do we or don't we? And I would remind us all, given the conversation we had 55 minutes ago, that Romans 14, when we studied Romans 14 in here back in February or whenever, one of the greatest illustrations, one of the greatest applications of Roman 14 in our world today is the issue of alcohol. And so we need, to, we need to tread carefully. We need to not ever be a stumbling block for another brother or sister. When we, have, uh, when we have personal liberty under the law of grace, we need to exercise great caution in how we exercise that personal liberty. That's correct. And they probably could have shirked it, but in doing so they would have cultivated the, the anger of the Jewish leadership. They probably could have dismissed it, but then the Jewish leadership would have come after Jesus even harder. And again and again and again in Matthew, we see a reference to what they call the Messianic secret, where Jesus is basically not trying to make the Pharisees and Sadducees any angrier than they already are. Good, good, good question. Let's pray, and we'll, and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for your goodness to us. Oh God, thank you that you have, uh, you have fulfilled the Old Testament law and we are now under an age of grace because of the finished work of King Jesus upon the cross. And God, thank you for the fact that we are sons of God and we have great liberty and great privilege because you have called us your own. We are unworthy of it. We don't deserve it. We're not entitled to it. Rather, you freely give us the, the, the love and the grace that we don't deserve uh, because, you, because you love us so much. God, thank you for this great message of salvation worth proclaiming. Oh God, when we leave this place, may we be faithful to proclaim it. We ask these things in Jesus' saving name. Amen.